Welcome, Dr. Conley. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here today. Um, I am actually very, very interested to learn about, um, you know, all of your journeys and what you have done. You have some remarkable accomplishments. I mean, having a doctorate in neuroscience and working in an industry that can be very male dominated, and you've been so successful in your own right, um, that we are thrilled to have you here and share some of your pearls of wisdom with our audience. So without further ado, let's dive right in and Tell us a little bit about who is Dr. Emily Conley and how did you get where you are today? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, and I guess I'm going to go way back to sort of the beginning for me. Uh -huh. um, one of the, the earliest jobs I had when I was still in high school was teaching autistic children how to swim. Mm. And um, I was so fascinated to understand, to get to know these people and understand how they learned and also like, why do some people have autism and some people don't? And, you know, it's more common in males than females. And so mm -hmm. that was the beginning for me of really wanting to understand why we are who we are, what's the role of the brain in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of kicked off my, my scientific journey. And I ultimately, uh, you know, pursued an academic path. I went on to get a PhD in neuroscience uh, and did a lot of work in genetics um, and really was passionate about like, how can I understand disease and how can I translate what we are learning about genes and the brain and health into things that actually help people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I ended up, um, leaving academia, which was kind of a bold thing to do, uh, right. and uh, taking a job in early 2010 at a company called 23andMe that at the time, nobody in my life had right. ever heard of. It was a very small company. It was about 30 people. Uh, and I um, joined to oversee their neuroscience research and ultimately uh, you know, moved on to uh, help build out a business development team there and stayed for a little over a decade where I ran business development and corporate development um, and, uh, and, and just learned so many things. I mean, it was an incredible and an absolutely incredible experience to see that company be where it is today. It's now a public yes. company and helping a lot of people. Um, and, uh, and I, after my time there, I was still hungry to have more of this kind of translational impact. Mm -hmm. And um, I uh, took the helm as CEO at a company called Federation Bio, where we're making medicines um, for, for patients with all different kinds of diseases using bacteria, uh, which is a particularly awesome. innovative way to, to make drugs. Yes. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's been an, an incredible ride. And I know one of the things that you focus on a little bit in the podcast is kind of what are the lessons, you know, yes. that, um, that have been important. And when I reflect back on my career and the lessons, you know, the leaders that I've been drawn to and the kind of leader that I think I am, it's, there's this thread of authenticity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the CEO at 23andMe was this incredibly authentic leader. I've had other amazing female mentors. Um, and, uh, and it's something that I think I really embody. And some of that came through some big struggles, um, I was, uh, I grew up in the Midwest and I was a gay teenager in a, you know, pretty conservative town. And I came out in my early twenties, mm -hmm. which was really hard and not everybody in my life was yes. uh, happy, uh, let's say. Um, and, uh, but it was so important, you know, for me to know myself and to be brave enough to share that with the world. And I think a lot of the kind of personal growth that happened around the process of coming out, um, I actually leverage in my professional life now. Yes, yes. That's so fascinating. And I, you know, your story is so remarkable in the sense that, you know, a lot of the times individuals can't tie back to where their kind of passion or where their focus came. And you at a very young age, it seems like in working with these autistic kids, realized that you had a intrinsic kind of curiosity and motivation to want to learn more and you went with it um, yeah. which is fantastic because I think a lot of individuals may have those passions but then societal norms or you know people telling you where you're supposed to fit in in a box and you you know pursue a different career path but you stuck with you know science and neuroscience and areas that aren't necessarily would say predominantly female oriented um I would say uh, discipline. So 
tell me a little bit, you know, what were some of the struggles there? Did you, did you have struggles in the sense that maybe at a young age, people were telling you, no, 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 that's not a career path you should follow? Or did you have all that support and kind of what helped you kind of stick to your guns and say, this is what I wanted to do? Because you certainly didn't choose the easiest path in the world. <laughs> it's true. You know, I feel really lucky um, that my parents um, were very supportive. And I remember my dad in particular, when I was a kid, he would say things like, you can be anything you want to be. And I knew he really believed that for me. And I think it gave me a lot of permission um, to think really big uh, mm -hmm. about what I wanted to do. Um, and I think that kind of permission giving is important. Like as a leader, that's something that I espouse to my employees. It's something I mm -hmm. you know, share with my kids, like um, this idea of like really think big for yourself. And so I do feel like I got some good messaging around that, mm -hmm. um, that sort of, bolstered me as I encountered the inevitable, um, you can't do it mentality <laughs> for whatever reason, you know, right. as a woman, um, as a lesbian, at, you know, when I was in high school, I, I was like super punk rock, which is kind of funny. <laughs> if you look at me now, you wouldn't perhaps anticipate that. And I had a teacher once, um, I walked into his class, uh, it was maybe ninth or 10th grade. And, uh, you know, he made me sit in the front row because he thought I was going to be a total troublemaker because of how I looked. <laughs> and, uh, and at the end of the year, I was like his favorite student. I like won this award as the most outstanding senior female, whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, um, uh, and so I think that some of it is about, um, having the belief in yourself and like showing up. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't believe you can do it, um, it's going to be pretty hard, like, the world may not tell you that you can, right? So right. a lot of that has to come from inside. You know, you, it's remarkable what you said in terms of authenticity, because even even in the stories that you share of like, you know, total punk rock, just being who you were, who, you know, who you felt like you wanted to be. And it, it wasn't necessarily, you were probably walking to the beat of your own drum and, and dressing yeah. in that way, because not everybody was also doing that. Um, Tell me a little bit about, you know, there's a level sometimes of, of, I would say what we hear a lot of individuals talking about now is self-doubt, imposter syndrome, uh, the fear of kind of like not fitting in. Yeah. And, you know, just given some of the parallel struggles, I mean, I very much resonate with what you're saying of being kind of, um, a, you know, at the time, a young Latina who was gay, who really wasn't out and trying to struggle with all of these different things where you don't necessarily feel like you fit in. And sometimes that lack of that sense of belonging does kind of like shoot the the, the self doubt up quite yeah. a bit. So, how did you get past that? And even to this day, do you still struggle with some of those things? And and how do you kind of move forward through the fear? Yeah, it is a really good question. And yes, I mean, I think those those thoughts are there, right? I'm a first time CEO, so I, you know, when I took this job, I thought, oh my gosh, can I do it? Uh, you uh -huh. know, I had moments of thinking like, do they really know like <laughs> that <laughs> who they've hired? Uh -huh. um, and, uh, uh, and so, but I think it's really normal. And luckily those um, voices, there's like an, uh, there's another voice in there that's like, you got this, you're doing great. You ask for help. Like, you know, yes. and I've developed that over time. And I think, um, one of the things that we don't talk about enough in the corporate world, when we think about, especially as women, and we think about getting ahead, we really silo it. Like, what are your technical skills? What's yes. the experience on your CV? Like that is so much focus. And when I think about the success I've had, like an equal, if not majority of that success has been attributed to a lot of personal work that I've done outside of what's happened in my day-to-day -day job. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of growing um, through lots of different ways, uh, that, and that footwork has been really important, um, in kind of calming those voices of self-doubt and, um, you know, developing a lot of the, the skills that you need as a leader in terms of like how to manage difficult conversations and how to bring in the expertise that you need or how to, you know, make sure that you're hiring the right mix of folks. Like a lot of the skills there are things that came through me like doing work around coming out or mm -hmm. you know um other kind of uh, personal work therapy work all that stuff like we don't talk about it and it's kind of taboo but it's right. actually so essential to being a good leader mm, that's so insightful 
And wanting to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> what you were, you were kind of talking, alluding to in working through making huge transitions and decisions. So one of the things that, you know, we work with a lot of women is trying to help them be more decisive. And you've had a lot of transitions in your career and in life, like, you know, deciding to finally say, okay, I'm going to come out or yeah. deciding that I'm going to leave academia and go into the corporate world. How did you weigh those, you know, the risk kind of reward kind of, yeah. you know, what, what is the thought process you go through when you are making a big decision? Yeah, I think with some of those really big ones, um, an important flag is discomfort like mm -hmm. profound, profound discomfort uh -huh. where when I was in academia, I sort of realized like, I'm not happy. This isn't. Mm -hmm. And so that was the gateway through which it was like, okay, this isn't working. I'm unhappy. I'm uncomfortable. Something isn't fitting here. Mm -hmm. So I have to be awake enough to notice that stuff. And then mm -hmm. to kind of be curious about it, like, okay, well, I know, you know, my plan was that I was going to be an academic professor. That was the plan that I was on. Uh, and, um, and then I sort of, you know, started to really realize like, this isn't what's right for me. Something isn't fitting here. And mm -hmm. so then I did a lot of um, talking to people um, mm -hmm. and like exploring, you know, women with different careers. I actually ended up um, my wife uh, was um, also doing some career changing. And she asked me to go to this, like, Mm -hmm. start out event and which I kind of begrudgingly was like sure I'll support you I'll go and then I met a woman there who worked in biotech and uh -huh. I kind of told her my story and where I was at and she became this wonderful mentor and mm -hmm. helped me with the process of evaluating like where to go and mm -hmm. um, was pretty instrumental in getting me to 23 and Me. Uh, oh. and so that I think you know sort of popping your head up, looking around, talking to other folks, being willing to sit in that discomfort and not, it can be so tempting to jump to the answer to say like, right. I'm uncomfortable. I don't want to be uncomfortable anymore. The answer is now I'm going to go and do X. But right. if you don't really do the work in that time period, um, you might end up going down a path that isn't, you know, the right one for you. Right. Right. So it takes a lot of that introspection. And, and I love what you said in asking people questions and asking for help and being curious and finding the people who were kind of maybe living the life or the yeah. role or the job that you wanted and getting to know a little bit more of, is this the right path? Exactly. Exactly. And being really open-minded. Like even when I took that first job at 23andMe, mm -hmm. I took it as a scientist, mm -hmm. you know, running neuroscience research. And then it became very clear the company was small. It was about 30 people. There was all this inbound interest in collaborating and there was nobody to handle that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I sort of was like, Oh, that's, I like talking to people. I like, you know, <laughs> thinking about, uh, you know, what, how we could work together. And, um, and so then that segued me into onto this business development path. You know, and I'm so glad you went there because I was going to ask, you know, the question of you did go in it in a very scientific kind of yeah. role. And then you made that transition to more of the kind of like leadership, more administrative, strategic yeah. kind of, you know, development type of role. What was that like? Like what skill sets or how did you identify those competencies of like, oh, I really do like to do, do this and it would lend itself to that. How did you explore some of that? Yeah, some of it happened almost um, like in real time, you know, people huh? would be reaching out and we'd be thinking about, well, how could we partner? And I'd be thinking, well, okay, what would make sense for the, the, or for the business? Like, what should we be trying to get out of this? What could we bring mm -hmm. to the table? What is the outcome that we could have that could help patients? Um, so some of it started to happen organically and, but there was definitely a huge gap. I mean, I feel like I've had so many jobs in my life that I've been horribly underqualified for. And, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and you, <laughs> and so I sort of learn, you learn on the job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's a thing that women are, um, you know, men are, seem to be perhaps more comfortable yes. kind of taking something on and saying like, I don't have all these skills, but I'll apply for this job. And yes. women are like, oh, well, if I don't check every single line item in the job description, like I couldn't possibly be qualified. Um, and so I've just gotten really comfortable kind of taking on things where uh, I'm sort of learning. And I'm uh, there's an element of humility that's required there that there will be times mm -hmm. where um, I'm going to stumble and I will look like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and that's okay. And like, I can tolerate that. And uh, and so at 23andMe, I you know, kind of started doing some of this stuff. And then the company hired in a woman 
um, Ashley Domkowski, who became a great mentor to me that had was quite seasoned in the business world. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot by watching her and um, really, uh, you know, wanting to emulate a, a lot of how she approached things. And I did some additional, like I went to Stanford and did a, like a little mini MBA course. Like I was, you know, I'm a learner. So I yes. went to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you said that because I really do believe that in this age of digital disruption, things constantly changing. I mean, there's a scary statistic out there that the skill set, the shelf life of skills is only 18 months. And so wow. the true superpower is learning and, yeah. and just in time learning as well, if we want to even get more specific. And so I love what you said, um, because there is that statistic out there that when it comes to opportunities, job descriptions, things like that. Women do self, they opt out because they don't yeah. check every single box. And, um, you know, I think the statistics like 86% of men, if they check off two things, they'll still throw their name in the hat and figure out the rest. Um, but tell me a little bit about how did you when you said, okay, I'm only checking four or five things off this list, and I'm still going to put my name in the hat, and I'm still going to take the CEO job or this business development job, I'll figure out the rest on the way there. What does that mean when you say I'll figure it, figure it out? Like, is it like you said, you know, more studies or is it just kind of like take it day by day? <laughs> A mix of things. Um, I mean, as CEO, a lot of it is like having a lot of really smart people around me. So always mm -hmm. like always trying to hire people that are smarter than me. That's like mm -hmm. the, the number one criteria <laughs> is like bringing in people that know more about things that I don't know about. That's right. what I need. Right. Um, and again, that sort of ties back to, I think, some level of teachability and not, you know, I think we sometimes get coached as women that we need to be confident yeah. and that that means that we need to know everything. And I don't think, I actually think what it means is that we need to know what we know and know what we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's really okay to not know things. And um, it's been really satisfying with the team that I have here that I think people love this style of leadership because they get very empowered. Like when I bring in someone, you know, my head of regulatory, uh -huh. um, you know, it's an area that she is by far, uh, you know, more expert than I am. And so she really gets to own that space mm -hmm. and um, which is satisfying for her. And it's great because it means I've now brought in someone that can teach me things that can effectively do the job. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I sort of, thinking of like, I have this strategy of like building out the team where it's like thinking about what are all the gaps I have? What are the gaps we have as a team? And then bringing mm -hmm. in people with that skill and not being threatened that it somehow means that I'm not a good enough leader or a good enough CEO to have people that are smarter than me. Like it's actually totally the opposite. It means that like, we've got a really thriving group and we can achieve really great things. That is so insightful because I think some of the key things you were saying that it's okay to not know everything, uh, which I do think that it's something, you know, I've, I've done quite a bit of studying around the whole imposter phenomenon and the imposter syndrome that Dr. Valerie Young has done. And I love her kind of competency ar archetypes where she talks about, they sometimes are like, if you're known as the expert, then you sometimes have this uh, self-doubt or shame when you don't have the answer and the idea yeah. that you know behind all of that is that I love that you said is like be confident in knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and then yeah. seeking out the experts who actually know the other stuff that you don't know um and it's you know I see it it, it almost made me think about like the president of the United States right <laughs> he surrounds himself with the world's best kind of, you know, um, experts to get the job done. So nobody is going to be able to have the answers to everything. Um, and I think seeing it in your example is very tangible and, and, you know, seeing that there is a bit of humility of like, no, I don't know everything, but I do know who to go to. That's right. Yeah. It's so essential. It really, really matters. And that I don't um, feel guilty about it anymore. You know, like when right. there's things, there's just too much to know. I mean, my goodness, like the science alone is is pretty vast for what we're tackling here. And mm -hmm. then you add all of the pieces on top of that manufacturing and regulatory and um, clinical trials. And uh, there's a lot. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's impossible for any one person to be a complete expert in all of those things. And it also mm -hmm. is not fun to work with people like that because <laughs> you sort of feel like, well, if you're the expert in everything, then what do you even need me for? Right. Uh, so right. I think it makes for a nice, um, you know, people get to feel like their skills are really tapped into. 
I have a question. You, you've, you know, mentioned um, quite a bit of like having mentors and sponsors and individuals you identified that you wanted to emulate, uh, you know, some characteristics of success that you identified. Um, we get, we, we coach women to do that in, in our beyond barriers cohorts and whatnot. But the biggest question I get is like, how do you do that? How do you go out to reach someone that maybe you admire that you don't know? How do you cultivate those relationships? How do you gain access to those key instrumental people in your life? I think some of my advice would be to look around you mm -hmm. that many of the amazing mentors I've had were just people that were in my immediate universe. It wasn't mm -hmm. somebody famous or that, you know, that um, I had to kind of lure in somehow. It was like, mm -hmm. I was already surrounded by some pretty smart people. And, right. uh, and I think sometimes we get tripped up in the asking, like, what if I ask them to be my mentor and yes. they say no, but it's not so much. It's like, just start emailing them. Like it's whoever answers the phone, like that person is mentoring you, right? Yes. So it doesn't have to be so formal. And as you build a relationship with someone, like I, I, the people that have mentored me, I don't think they, I never asked them to be my mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a much more kind of informal thing that I would sort. And I think they got something out of it because um, it was nice for them to share their experience and they saw me growing. Uh, which was cool. And so I think, yeah, my main advice is like, look in your immediate, for a person that's one or two steps ahead of you, it doesn't have to be so dramatic and it doesn't have to be so formal that they sort of feel like, oh, I can't take on having a mentee right now. I've got this full-time job. Instead, it's like, hey, can we go for a walk? And then after that walk, hey, can we get a coffee? You know, it's like yeah, yeah. more simple. I love that. And I love the idea of, like you said, someone who may be just a few steps ahead of you um, because I feel like maybe the advice they'll give you is a little bit more tangible than someone who is 10 years your senior yeah. and then they like, you know, forget some of the, the smaller steps that they took to get there. Um, and, and sometimes we forget that and we think that it needs to be someone who's like already climbed Mount Everest. Um, but really those around you who may be just a few steps ahead of you are the ones that you can learn from the most. I think that's powerful. Yeah. Agreed. And to also that the, I think that that mentor relationship, like some of that happens through one-on-one -on -one conversation, but for me, some of it also happened just through observation. Like I watched mm -hmm. those women and I watched like, how do they talk to investors? How do they run pitch meetings? How do they, how do they communicate? And mm -hmm. I learned from watching them. And so I, that's part of it too. Yes. So changing gears a little bit, you, you know, come from a science background and, you know, you were talking a little bit about, you know, setbacks and failures. And that is one thing that we see a lot of women struggling with of like, you know, just failure or the fear of failure. So they end up kind of missing or, you know, passing on opportunities because of that fear that they might fail. And so what is your two cents on failure and dealing with failure. How do you view it? Yeah, I think some of this comes back to um, doing that personal work about like knowing who you are and the intrinsic mm -hmm. value that you have, uh, that no matter what happens, right, that you are a valuable member of the human race. And um, so there's some groundedness, right? I feel like I, over the years have developed a groundedness so that even if things go totally sideways, it's like, all right, I'm gonna be okay, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think failures are really important. Um, and the way, uh, the way that we react to them matters a lot, right? It's like mm -hmm. something yes. bad can happen and we can then layer a bunch of bad feelings on top of it. And now we're suffering because there was like the primary bad thing that happened. And then all of our like self-flagellation and interpretation, that's like another layer. Mm -hmm. And so the main goal for me is like getting that other layer off, like the bad stuff, you know, things aren't always, I mean, I work in an industry and in drug development, like it's plagued by failures. It's just part of doing science. Like we have a lot to learn. And, right. um, and so when those things happen, if I can bring that groundedness and steadiness that for me has come through a lot of development I've done outside of my corporate job, mm -hmm. I can bring that groundedness and say like, okay, like I, I fundamentally believe in a world where like, I'm going to be okay. Things are going to mm -hmm. be okay. I mm -hmm. have value like those things that are studying in mm -hmm. those times of failure and then using them. This is the humility teachability piece of like, okay, what can I, you know, anytime something happens, mm -hmm. I need to look at what my part is in it. 
Um, like I have an employee that is wants to leave the organization. What's our part? What could we have done better? That right. should always be the question every time. Like, what can I learn from this? What's my part in it? And then I can use that to grow and do the next one better. And when you take that kind of learning approach, the failures don't seem as overwhelming because mm -hmm. it's kind of all on the journey of growth. Right. I love that sense of accountability that you just pointed out in terms of what could I have done better? What could we have done better um, in order to mitigate the failure in the future? Um, but the other piece is you equating failure to learning. Like, you know, we fail a lot, but it's because we have a lot of learning to do and you learn yeah. through that failure. And I think that is e extremely critical to keep reminding ourselves to do a bit of a word association of, you know, failure and learning are hand in hand um, and, it, and it fosters growth. And so I, I really appreciate you aligning that. Absolutely. I have one more question for you that isn't necessarily on our prep doc, but I'm just fascinated by um, your background in neuroscience and then the whole 23andMe and working in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I found it to be phenomenal in that, you know, the 23andMe where people doing their genetic testing and getting results and finding out stuff about their, you know, genetics and even ancestry and things like that, that opened up people's frames of reference around, you know, even like, you know, ethnicity and different things like that. Did you see you or, or see anything on how some of that impacted or maybe opened up conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Definitely. A hu I mean, this was one of the really cool things about being at 23andMe in this kind of pivotal time where genetics was just starting to yes. um, come on the scene in popular culture. Uh -huh. And uh, and people were taking the 23andMe test and learning more about their ancestry and often finding surprises that yes. they found out they had some unexpected ancestry they didn't know about. Um, and 23andMe actually did this very cool ad campaign um, that was called uh, like 99% human because all, yes. all of us were over 99% genetically identical, like literally exactly the same, because most of your DNA is about what makes you a human and not a bumblebee or a banana. And those right. things have DNA too. So most uh -huh. of your DNA is about like building a human eyeball or a heart. Uh, and I think it's been very powerful for people to see um, a lot of these old barriers that we had around kind of race and identity um, yeah. that they're not so uh, black and white, pardon the pun, uh -huh. uh, but they're, uh -huh. you know, that we're much more complex. Um, yes. And I think also for people to realize that um, their identity is, it has, is constructed from multiple things. Like there's the, the genetics and the actual, like your parentage, but there's mm -hmm. also the culture that you grew up in and your rituals and um, those things matter too. Yes. Uh, but just lots of cool stories of people being reunited, uh, you know, through 23andMe or learning really powerful things about their ancestry and then going on like big trips to various places to learn yes. more or like, change, you know, just all kinds of stuff. It was, that was a very cool part of, uh, of working there. Yeah, that was, it's been fantastic to kind of see people their frame of reference around race open up, but then understanding that ethnicity has much more to do sometimes of how you identify and belong. Um, I felt like just, you know, it was an amazing, you know, turning point in science that, you know, you never would have thought would have opened up conversations in a very sensitive topic like diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, uh, you know, when I heard and I learned more about you, I'm like, oh my God, this is fascinating because I yeah. never, you know, I have a bachelor's in biology because I thought I was going to go down the, the doctor track, the medical track. And then like you, you know, exposed to so many other things because there was a, a narrow kind of like uh, frame of reference of what success meant to my family coming from a small town, you know, doctor or lawyer is what you needed to be. And then you get into college and you realize there's so much more. Um, but I was just fascinated by your background and still am fascinated by all the things that you've accomplished with your, with your, you know, background, as well as kind of crossing over and leveraging, you know, your competencies in that way. So I want to thank you for all of the time that you have graced Beyond Barriers in our podcast. And I'm sure that our audiences are going to be, their, their interest has been piqued and they'll likely want to follow you or just kind of understand how could they get in contact with you? What's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Is it, you know, do you have blogs? What is it that you, you would want people to do to follow you on? 
Yeah, it's probably a place where I could do better. Um, LinkedIn <laughs> is a great place to find me, uh, uh -huh. Emily Dravant Conley um, on LinkedIn. Um, I have a Twitter account, but I um, am mostly just a, a lurker on Twitter. I don't actually do much tweeting. Uh, yeah. But so those are two places, uh, places to find me. Fantastic. So last final words, you know, words of wisdom or just parting kind of uh, comments that you would like to leave our audience? Yeah, I mean, do your work um, and prioritize uh, prioritize the time and the energy that it takes to do that outside of your job, whether that's exercise, meditation, whatever that is mm. um, for you, like make that time. And instead of feeling guilty about taking that time, know that that is actually contributing to your success in your job. Mm, that is fantastic. Yes. Re-energizing yourself in any way that you can and being unapologetic. I love that, yeah. Dr. Conley. Thanks again for your time. And we um, hope to stay connected. Thank you.